Welcome everyone who's joined us virtually on Zoom. Uh, welcome to Green Drinks. Um, my name is Ginevra. I'm the program coordinator at Sustainable Woodstock. Um, I see more of you are coming in, I'm admitting you. Um, Sustainable Woodstock is a nonprofit organization. We're founded in 2009. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and empower everyone to live environmentally, economically, and socially responsible lives. So you've come to one of our monthly Green Drinks events. Um, green Drinks are social events. They happen every month, typically in person, but right now we have gone virtual. Um, we're hoping to connect people around sustainability issues. So we invite local nonprofits, individuals, businesses to come and present. So we're going to hear from Ham Gillett today. Um, he is currently the program and outreach coordinator for the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste Management District and the outreach coordinator for the Southern Windsor slash Windham, Windham County Solid Waste Management District. That is a mouthful, Ham. Yes, it is. Um, in the early 90s, he assisted Jed Dickinson with the startup of Woodstock Recycling and Refuse um, when the town of Woodstock first passed a mandatory recycling ordinance. Ham worked for WRRC for six years, he thinks, and might even have picked up your trash at 4 a.m. on a Monday morning. He also worked for several years at DSM Environmental Services in Windsor, Vermont, a consulting company known internationally for its work on resource recovery and recycling. He has sorted through municipal trash, food scraps, and recycling, from Dayton to DC. Many years ago, Ham earned an MFA in acting from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which has helped him tremendously in his present career. So I think that's all from me. You never wrote that idea. <laughs> I would never. Um, yeah, so why don't, you, why don't you take it away, Ham? Okay, thanks, Ginevra. Uh, and thank you and Michael for um, inviting me to do this. This is uh, great. As I told them about 15 minutes ago, um, they, you better have a sign to cut me off because when I get talked about this stuff, I get kind of passionate. And um, I also said to them that I want very much, uh, I don't want to talk for a long time. And I also want uh, there to be plenty of time for people to ask questions because I find invariably whenever I give one of these presentations, uh, there are lots of questions. So I want to be sure that you get to ask them. I will try to answer them. And just one other note, um, if for some reason we run out of time, um, you can always contact me at the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste District office uh, by phone or email, and maybe uh, Ginevra could post those somewhere at some point. Okay, um, I want to tell you a story, a brief story. Um, I'm going to talk about batteries later, but I want to tell you a story that I just um, heard from my coworker, Mary O'Brien, who works for the Southern Windsor Winter County Solid Waste Management District. She was, um, she had picked up some, uh, a bucket of batteries in front of uh, Damon Hall in Heartland, where it was one of the places that we, we have um, battery boxes, battery buckets for you to drop off batteries. And she was sitting in her house uh, sorting batteries. We have to sort them by type and we have to put them in plastic bags and put them in a fireproof box. And she said, all of a sudden she heard this pop and uh, this something went flying past her head and she couldn't figure out what it was. And she put her, what she was doing down and she looked around and she found half of a button battery that had exploded uh, in her room where she was working and uh, it landed, uh, part of it landed on her desk and it was very hot to the touch. Um, I bring that up because I'm gonna be talking about batteries later and I didn't wanna to forget to tell this story. Um, so just remember that. Um, I wanna do, a, uh, let you know about something that really cool that happened uh, November 7th that would, has never happened as far as I know in the Upper Valley. Um, we had a sap line uh, used, no longer good sap line uh, recycling event at the South Woodstock Fire Station. It was largely organized by uh, the Maple Sugar Producers uh, Association, uh, Windsor County, and Mary McQuaig from Top Acres Farm in South Woodstock had a lot to do with it. Um, they 
connected with the Northwest Solid Waste Management District who provided a 30 yard roll off container, drove it down here, parked it at the fire station and in four hours with 16 participants, we collected 6,000 pounds of material. Uh, Michael Caduto was there for a while. He can, uh, he can attest to it. And we filled the container to almost above capacity. There was a little article in the Vermont Standard about it last week. But um, we had one guy drive up from, his, uh, from down in Marlborough, Vermont, and somebody from Versher and somebody from West Fairley. So um, they came from a while. It was a huge success. We had no idea that it was gonna be uh, so successful. And we are planning to do another one. Um, I didn't have a lot to do with it. I helped uh, advertise it and I was there on Saturday helping unload, but um, we were thrilled. And so if you know anybody, if any of you are uh, maple producers or you know anybody who is, uh, tell them to stay tuned. First, tell them to join the uh, Windsor County Maple Producers Association. Uh, and then uh, we'll be having one COVID permitting uh, next year sometime. So stay tuned about that. Pam, would you like me to share a photo of that event? Oh, that would be great. Okay. That would be great. Um, and I would just tell you uh, that, so the Northwest <laughs> Solid Waste District is in, um, in Georgia, Vermont, which is sort of near St. Albans. Uh, they collect sap material, sap line material, they bale it, and then they ship it when they have a full semi-truck load to Arkansas and it gets uh, ground up and made into some other plastic product. So, you know, plastic's still there out in the world, but at least it's not going in the landfill where, which, or being left in the woods, which uh, has happened um, up until this point. So we're, we are thrilled about that. Um, tell you a little bit about our two hazardous waste collection events we had this year. Uh, one in, trying to scroll down here, uh, we had one in both at the Hartford Transfer Station in collaboration with them. Um, we had one in July and one in uh, September. Uh, huge participation. We had uh, 275 at one and 250 at the other. There were, it was a, maybe some of you were there. There was a double line of traffic. The hour, the wait was about uh, one hour in line. And we collected, uh, I just did my town report today, we collected uh, a little over 20,000 tons of material. Um, I did a poll and a lot of people had, were there for the first time, which was great. Um, it means people, more and more people are, are understanding that you really shouldn't and can't throw this stuff in the landfill or dump it behind your barn. Um, I did want to point out one thing which I thought was interesting. The manager of the September event told me afterwards that they filled a 55 gallon drum full of window cleaner. Uh, that's a lot of window cleaner. That's people bringing in, you know, Windex, whatever, um, you know, cleaning out, not using it, buying it and not using it or using some of it and then throwing it out but it was perfectly good. And so that's all going to be incinerated at some uh, big uh, facility out in the, in the Midwest. But um, I make that point because um, I'm always trying to sort of drive home the point to people that there's, there are other alternatives to many of the cleaning products that you buy in uh, a hardware store or the grocery store. And my apologies to the, those stores, but um, if you read the labels, sometimes the materials are on there, sometimes they aren't, but uh, just consider 20,000 or 20,000 tons of material came from the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste District uh, that had to be thrown out. A lot of it was Roundup um, and other pesticides and you know wasp and wasp killers and stuff like that. So I would just ask you, beg you to be mindful the next time you go out to buy something to clean your toilet with or your bathtub or um, get rid of some wasps, just um, realize that uh, the material chances are is toxic and it's gonna have to be disposed of as, uh, as hazardous waste, which means uh, in most cases incinerated. Um, so keep that in mind, thanks. Uh, 
Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. I already said that. All right. Um, yeah, the cost for these two events, the September, the July event was $28,000 and the event in September was 29,000 and uh, 8,000 of that was just for pesticides. That's just, that's the disposal cost that has nothing to do with uh, what we pay the contractor to drive up from Connecticut or down from Williston or the district employees time that's just disposal costs. Um, we get a grant from the Vermont Ag Agency for uh, to help us pay for pesticides, but their money is dwindling and they're now having to give uh, a, a part of their funding to um, water cleanup in the state and also to um, trying to resurrect the bee population. So they've got a finite amount of money and it's being spread more and more places. So um, we, uh, we, it costs the district a lot of money to get rid of all that stuff. Um, okay. <laughs> oh, here's one. I get a lot of questions or a lot of emails to people asking me from, this is from Greater Upper Valley. They asked me um, questions about the Hartford Transfer Station. And um, I try to explain, and when I explain this, I ask them to please educate their friends and neighbors. But the, the Hartford Transfer Station and the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste District are two completely separate entities. Some of you may have been around here long enough to remember when the town of Hartford was a member of the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste District. It broke off years ago before I started this job and they are their own solid waste district. The town of Hartford runs the Hartford Transfer Station. They are very kind and they let GUV residents and businesses use the facility uh, for a fee. But um, if you have questions about what they might take or when their hours are, it's better to contact them directly. Um, I will try to answer the question if you call me, but um, just so I just want people to know that there's a there's a difference between the two and we are not, we are only related in that we use the facility. We do not run it. We do not make the rules or call, um, establish the pricing or anything. Okay. Um, on to food scraps. I'm sure everybody on this call is, has been sorting their food scraps since July 1st, which is when the law went into effect for everybody, residents and businesses and the like. Um, so I wanted to take a little bit of time to tell people about what your options are. Um, and I've been getting a lot of questions about it. And we sold over 100 soil saver composters in the space of about 10 days in late June in early July, and I've still got a bunch of them in our barn in Escutney. So if you would like one, they make great stocking stuffers or um, a kitchen pail for $5. The, the uh, soil savers are 50, which is a great deal. Anyway, contact me later. Um, so your options for food scraps, uh, composting at home. You can take it to the Hartford transfer station uh, they are now charging a fee for it. And again, the rules keep changing. So I never can remember whether they, their facility wants food scraps in bags or loose. So you might want to go on their website or give them a call 295-2673. That's 295-2673. Um, that is one option. Another, uh, for those of you who are in the uh, Able Waste area, they run a fast trash on Saturday at the Bridgewater Town Garage from, I think it's eight to one. Uh, they take food scraps in bags. They sell you the bags. They also run a similar operation on Route 12 in Heartland across from the fire station. Same thing, same deal. Uh, those are their two, uh, their two operations. And I understand that they've just started and they've added on a Wednesday afternoon collection in Bridgewater. And I would say go to their website to get the exact hours on that. 
um, grow compost based in Moortown. They also are leasing land from the uh, Solid Waste District in North Heartland. You may have heard about it. Uh, they mainly pick up commercial entities at this point, but they, uh, they also will do uh, multifamily, anything over four units, uh, apartments. Um, so if you happen to live in an apartment with, with four or more units, um, comp Grow Compost may be picking up um, your food scraps. Um, a lot of people who, grow, who live in, in um, condos or apartment units um, struggle with food scraps and I totally get that. And if you want more information uh, than what I've given you here, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm happy to walk you through some, some other options. Uh, there's also a company based in Lebanon called WeRecycleFood.com. Um, they advertise that they serve residential customers in Woodstock, in addition to, I think, probably Hanover, Norwich, Hartford area. But again, that's WeRecycleFood.com. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for doing this. I know many of you probably have been sorting food scraps for a long time. Some of you um, not. Some of you may still not be. And if I only ask that if you're struggling with it and you have a, you know, some hurdle that you can't seem to figure out, um, again, contact me. Um, I've had a lot of calls and done several of these uh, and I'm a, a Vermont master composter. It's not that that means much, but um, I'm happy to help you uh, figure out a solution. Um, a lot of people contact me about bears and um, I don't have a solution for that. I, I can tell you that uh, the people who, who live rurally and have a bear problem, uh, Sometimes they will put up an electric fence um, that will help considerably. You can bait it. I know this sounds mean, but um, you can bait it with uh, peanut butter and the bear will touch it with its nose and get zapped and probably remember that and not come back. It'll just go to your neighbor's house instead. Um, the other thing about bears and other critters, and you may have heard this somewhere from me, if you do it well, it doesn't smell. When you put your compost out in your backyard, when you open the top, you should never see food scraps. Every time you put food scraps in your composter, you should put three times as much brown material, shredded leaves, pine needles, sawdust, uh, wood chips, shredded newspaper, whatever. But th remember that if you remember nothing else, three to one. So uh, the food scraps, the food scraps need the carbon to help the, help the nitrogen break down. I'm not going to get any more scientific than that, but uh, believe me, you'll have much more success with your compost if you do three to one. Um, and one other thing I wanted to say about that. Oh, um, yeah. So the, uh, if the critters can't see it or they can't smell it, uh, chances are there'll be less there'll be less chance of them being attracted to your pile. Again, up, oh, there's a great uh, document that the Central Vermont Solid Waste District put out called, it's called the Dirt on Compost. They've been very generously shared it with anybody who wants to get it online. I don't know if they have hard copies or not, but if you Google uh, the Dirt on Compost or Central Vermont Solid Waste District, uh, you will find that, and it is by far the best document that I have, uh, that I've seen and most, the most comprehensive and the most user-friendly. Okay. Um, and I also, I already gave a push for composters and kitchen pails as holiday gifts. Uh, excellent idea and very worth the money. Okay. I had a woman, uh, she may be on this call tonight, I'm not sure, but I got a text from her later this afternoon saying, what do I do with batteries and paint? And um, when I get a call like that, quite, quite honestly, I kind of tear what hair I have left out uh, because I, um, 
we obviously are not doing quite a good enough job educating the public, but battery recycling and paint recycling um, has been part of the Vermont recycling picture for um, at least five or six, maybe more years. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to repeat myself. Um, and I will because there may be more than this one person who, um, who needs to be reminded. Vermont has this wonderful program called Paint Care. It is a national program. Vermont uh, works with it. You can take your paint, latex, oil base, uh, wood stains, deck stains, to uh, any participating hardware store or to the Hartford Transfer Station um, anytime, anytime. If you live in Norwich, they collect paint at the transfer station. If you, uh, Hartford takes it. Um, if you want to wait and store it up and bring it to one of our hazardous waste collections, you may do that, but you do not need to hang on to it. Um, these places have all signed up uh, and are official paint receptors or re, uh, whatever receivers. Um, so that's that's paint. Um, you don't have to put kitty litter in it any, anymore. Um, those days are gone. The two, the two things that would make it hazardous waste and not just paint are if the can is missing a label, so you can't identify what's in it, or the can is rusted and leaking. Paint care will not handle those two types of paint. Those you must wait and bring to a hazardous waste collection. Okay. Fluorescent bulbs, same thing. Please do not put them in the trash. I was at a um, uh, event, collection event up in, uh, I won't name the town, but uh, north of here several years ago. And this guy brought a um, broken four foot fluorescent tube in the back of his pickup. And he wanted, we were collecting fluorescent tubes. And I said, um, you know, sorry, we, we you know, we, I can't take a broken tube. You need to, can you take it home and tape it up or put a plastic bag around it and, and bring it back? And he picked it up and he smashed it on the back of his pickup truck. And he said, there, I guess we took care of that. And there were shards of, you know, mercury, powdered mercury flying all over the place and broken glass. So uh, they do contain mercury. Please do not put them in the trash. Um, again, you can take them to the Hartford Transfer Station anytime. They have a limit of 10 bulbs per trip. So take 10, go to do some shopping, come back, bring 10 more if you want, that's fine. Um, there are also hardware stores that will accept them as well. Um, let's see, okay, Vermont Electronics. Uh, there's a web, wonderful website called Vermont eCycles. Uh, if you want to know how to get rid of electronics, basically there was a law passed several years ago um, and computers, computer peripherals, which means um, mice, cables, monitors, towers, desktop printers, uh, they, any transfer station in the state that is registered with this program is required to take this material at no charge. Hartford is one of those facilities. You can take electronics there anytime. Those are covered. Non-covered is everything else. Your stereo, your speakers, your toaster, your clock radio, if anybody else has one, I do. Um, those you may or may not be charged a fee for, but I would highly encourage you to pay the small, tiny amount of money in order not to throw them in the landfill. Again, they really should not go in the landfill. Okay, um, batteries. Call to Recycle is the same similar company as Paint Care. It's a national company, Vermont. You probably may know that Vermonters recycle more batteries per capita than any other state in the country. We're being used as a, as a national model. Uh, again, hardware stores take your batteries, all batteries. Uh, if they're part of the program. I also have uh, in any town that doesn't have a uh, recycling facility, I have put out a, uh, and Mary, my colleague in Southern Wizards does the same thing, we've put out um, battery pails outside the town hall. 
There's one in Pomfret, there's one in Sharon, there's one in Heartland, there's one in Windsor, um, there's one in West Fairley, and there's one at the town office in Versher. Um, those other towns, Stratford, Thetford, Norwich, all collect batteries at their facility. Able Waste will take your batteries uh, for no charge at one of their fast trash collections. You can also take your batteries to the Hartford Transfer Station. Um, I'm probably forgetting somebody, but um, Google Call to Recycle. They have a, loca a locator to find out where the closest place is. They also have one, uh, one of those for paint care as well. Um, another story from my colleague, Mary. Uh, this just happened a while ago. There was a fellow down in, um, I won't, again, I won't name the town, but south of here who um, called the fire department, had a chimney fire and the fire department came and put it out and he had thrown, uh, among other things, he had thrown some batteries in his, in the fireplace. So um, they find him $750. And uh, a week or two later, uh, same guy calls again, fire department comes and he, uh, his burn barrel is caught on fire. And uh, he said, well, I put my batteries into my burn, bar burn barrel. So another 750 fine, plus the EPA caught up with him and find him, <laughs> this is the story here, uh, find him $30,000 for having an outdoor burn pile. So any of you who do that, uh, you might wanna reconsider it or uh, might wanna not throw any kind of batteries in the fire because it's not a particularly smart thing to do. Um, this guy claims he's not going to pay, whether he will or not. I hope he's learned his lesson. Um, I just learned on a Zoom meeting call yesterday with the, about hazardous waste that millennials are very guilty of not putting their recycling, their batteries, uh, not recycling them properly, Ginevra. I'm sure you're not one of those people. But... Um, us old folks, baby boomers, are much more, uh, much better about recycling and doing it right. The one thing that I've never witnessed, but I hear it happens all the time, people throw batteries in their um, mixed recycling bin. Please do not. Uh, they can go through the sorting facility and get ground up and start fires. Uh, I've seen pictures of uh, recycling facilities, MRF material recycling facilities that have burned down. I've also seen, also seen photographs of uh, a FedEx truck that burned completely down to the chassis because it was carrying some lithium batteries that were not properly packaged. And uh, yeah, serious stuff. More and more, more and more things are being made out with lithium batteries. Uh, E-bikes, if you go out to buy an e-bike, ask the person who's selling it to you what they have in store for recycling. Can you bring the battery back when it's dead? And if not, uh, what plans have they made and how can they uh, instruct you to recycle it? New, you know, another big problem. I now have heard that there are lithium batteries in diapers that indicate to the busy parent when their child pees. So. They're everywhere. Okay, um, sorry. You got like a few more minutes, Ham, so. Okay, because I'm almost done, isn't that great? Uh, perfect. Um, all right, I'm girl, scrolling to the end. Special recycling, batteries, um, e-bikes. Okay, I think I've covered almost everything. Oh, one thing I went to, a, I was on a webinar a couple of weeks ago, talk, the, the big wigs in the recycling world were talking about um, um, how we're gonna deal with all the recycling now that China won't take it. And there is a, there, it's, I sense that there is a, uh, there's a movement afoot for, um, which is not great news for us, but 
to concentrate on fewer material, recycling fewer materials, but doing them better. Uh, there's a big, huge problem with contamination. When in doubt, throw it out. Plastics one and two, you can be sure of, are recyclables. Once it gets into the three, four, five, six, seven, uh, maybe not. Ask your hauler or the ask who's picking up your recycling or the facility where you're dropping off your recycling what they take and ask them occasionally because the rules change all the time. And I want to say it again: if you have any doubt about something, please throw it in the trash. That's what got us into trouble with China. They started rejecting our recycling bales of recycling because we were throwing all kinds of stuff in there that, that don't belong. So uh, let's please everybody be mindful of that. Um, I think single stream recycling has uh, been a bad thing. Myself, I'll probably be slapped by my boss for saying that, but uh, it's made us all lazy. And back in the days when we had to sort everything separately, um, it was a pain in the neck, but um, the material was clean and facilities didn't receive a bunch of paper with ketchup on it. And um, so um, I think some countries in Europe are going back to uh, sorting everything. And I think it's a great idea. It'll never happen here, but that's my personal opinion. And I'm gonna leave you with one last thing that I always say, and that is when you throw something away, where is away? You blow your nose, you throw your Kleenex away. Where's that Kleenex gonna go? Can't go in your compost pile, according to me. Other people would say yes. But just be mindful of that. There is a big, huge hole up in uh, northern Vermont owned by Casella, which is the only landfill in Vermont. They've just uh, applied to expand the, the landfill. But most of the trash that is collected in this area is driven all the way to, uh, I believe it's in Moortown, it's 10 minutes from Canada. Think of that carbon footprint. So all of your trash is being hauled up to northern Vermont and buried in the ground. Um, and on that cheerful note, I'm going to end. Uh, and I hope there are a few questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Cam. Is that the Coventry landfill? Sorry, Coventry, Coventry. I couldn't remember it. It's kind of one of those strange towns, I guess, that you don't think of much, except for that reason. Um, yeah. Thank goodness for Jim. Um, no, thank you so much. That was like a really um, comprehensive overview of a lot of different areas. And we've had people typing in questions as we go. Um, I first want to, and Michael, um, our director, has been kind of posting some responses and also has mentioned that Ham has an article on recycling and composting that's published in this week's edition of the Vermont Standard uh, that came out today. So you can pick that up for more wisdom. Um, but I do want to get this question before I forget it because it came off our Facebook live stream. Does the Greater Upper Valley Waste Management District um, have a printable guide of what can and can't be recycled? Good question. Um, I am constantly trying to update our website because uh, it changes. Um, what I can do, uh, usually what I do is I ask the person um, where they live, who pick up their trash, because if you, if Casella uh, picks up your trash or if your material ends up at a Casella facility, Casella has a wonderful website that tells the do's and don'ts. Um, I'm going to make a note see if I can get that onto our, um, or a link to that on our website. And pretty much in this part of the world, what Casella, you know, what Casella says goes, whatever they're doing is what everybody else is doing. But that's a good point. Um, we do have an A to Z guide on our website, which tells how to get rid of pretty much everything, but it's, it's comprehensive. And I will uh, do my best to get that list. Yeah, and I can send out um, links to these things if, um, to everyone afterwards. You and I can collaborate, Ham. Yep. Um, I'm just going to go down from some of the first questions and see where we land. What is the best way to dispose of feed bags? Um, some have plas a plastic layer that's between two layers of like a thick paper. Others are woven poly pro. Can either be recycled? Uh, the ones that are part paper and part plastic, no. 
I mean, unless you want to go to the trouble to separate the plastic from the paper, um, there is no way. Use them for trash bags. Uh, try to reuse them again. The polypropylene bags, uh, again, right now, um, the, Vermont suffers from being so small and having such a tiny population that we don't generate enough volume of, say, uh, feed bags to make it worth anybody collecting them and hauling them anywhere. So um, I would say there are people around this uh, area who make uh, shopping bags out of them. It's a woman in, in Cornish, I think, who does that. Um, there's also a facility up in Grove to New Hampshire, which is um, trying to go online to turn plastic bags and the gigantic white farm marshmallow bags into, um, into uh, oil. Um, they're struggling, but a quick answer to your question is um, you, might, you might even just Google, how do I recycle polypropylene bags? In this area, in Great Upper Valley, uh, there, as far as I know, there is no place that is recycling them. All right, that's a great answer. Um, there's been some discussion in the chat about this question, but I'm just gonna, so I'm just gonna throw it out to you um, about why food scraps are kept out of the garbage since they rot anyway. Um, and what's the kind of the point of keeping them out of the landfill versus in your, um, in a compost system? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, Food scraps do not rot very fast in a landfill, which is what creates so much methane gas. Um, I once saw a photograph of a bunch of carrots that had been in a landfill and uncovered after 15 years, and they still looked like a bunch of carrots. Uh, what happens in a landfill is anaerobic digestion, uh, we, meaning that it doesn't require any oxygen. Are there are any scientists in the group um, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's right. Uh, so things do not break down very fast. Um, the other thing is that the reason that Vermont has created this law is number one, we have one landfill left. When that landfill's full, we don't have anywhere else to put our trash. It's gonna have to be shipped out of state and you're gonna be paying more to get rid of it. Uh, number two, there is a global realization uh, finally coming to this country that food scraps are much better being turned into compost and returned to the soil than going in a landfill. Um, we have diminished our tillable layer of soil in this country. Uh, if you want to ever want to Google Cat Buxton and grow more waste less, she'll tell you more than you ever needed to know, but she's totally into this. Um, so it's landfills is filling up too fast. Uh, it, the, the material causes a lot of methane to be released if it's buried in a landfill and it's much better to put it, uh, to turn it into compost and return it back to the soil. All right, um, a related question about compost. Um... And also I agree about Kat Buxton um, and everything you say about soil. It's super interesting to look into. Um, but we have a question about products labeled as compostable, like cups and like pl plastic silverwares and things. And what about those? And can they go anywhere for compost? No, steer clear of them. That's my personal opinion. A lot of it is greenwashing. Um, I work with a restaurant in, down in Ludlow that had trouble hiring a dishwasher. And um, so they just decided to do away with the position and to do away with dishwashing. And they invested a lot of money in compostable tableware. Um, their hauler, their, who they had contracted with to pick up uh, their food scraps, told them, we do not take compostable ware. Uh, it contaminates the food scraps. So they were stuck with a huge investment. Um, and I don't really know the end of the story, but I would say on a personal residential 
home level. Um, even the even the commercial recycling facilities where the piles, the big windrows of food scraps and compost get up to, you know, over 140 degrees, 150, 160, um, it takes forever for those things to break down. Uh, they absolutely will not break down in your backyard compost. So <clears throat> better to use uh, the real stuff or um, uh, these, one of the things that's popping up and I've tried to, I'm, I, I know about two women over in Cornish who did this. They, both of their children got, both of their kids got married at the, in the same summer. So they went out to yard sales and thrift stores and they bought uh, place settings of a hundred plates, coffee cups, glasses, uh, stainless steel, silverware, uh, dessert, whatever. And they have a shed and you can, anybody can use it. Um, so I would encourage you whenever possible to reuse, uh, you know, take your plate, take your silverware, take your glass. I know it's absolutely impossible in these days of COVID to do that safely uh, for most people. But um, I guess I don't need to go on about this, but I'm not a fan of compostable wear and um, it, it, you can't put it in, it contaminates the compost and it contaminates uh, recycling. It's not recyclable either. So it's in its own category and it's most of it's just ending up in the landfill. Mm, tell us how you uh, really feel, Ham. <laughs> no, that's, Sorry. no, it's great. Um, it's great to hear. You can challenge me on that. Call me up and I'll fight with you on the phone. Oh, fun, yeah. Um, yeah, it's something that I've run into a lot too, that discussion. So it's really good to hear your point of view. Um, this is maybe a quick question. Uh, what about paints that are hard? Like they're not liquid anymore. The can's been open and they've hardened. Uh, if it's absolutely rock hard solid uh, and you better open the can to check that out, uh, it can go in the trash. But if there's any liquid at all, uh, it should go to paint care or to a hazardous waste. Um. This, this question is just smoke detectors, question mark, but I'm guessing that's what to do with smoke oh. detectors, if they're recyclable or what? Uh, yeah, that's, that's another issue I have problems with because they're not, in Vermont, they're not considered recyclable. Um, they have a, uh, from, what I, from what I gather, some people I've asked, they have a tiny amount of americium in them, but the state doesn't consider that uh, a high enough level of radioactive material to, excuse me, start uh, a program to, re to recycle them. And so um, I take the batteries out. The plastic is not recyclable anywhere in this area. So they really have to go uh, in the landfill. I'm hoping that that is going to change sometime because it, it's, uh, it's a question I get all the time and I hate telling people the answer, but that's the answer. I'm learning a lot. Um, I have another question about recycling. Um, is it true that small items like medicine bottles or lids can't be recycled because they get caught up in machines? Um, yes. um, I don't have one with me, but uh, one of those, if any of you use um, post-it notes, there's one size that's two inches, two inches by two inches. Um, I know people who put one of those post-it notes next to the recycling bin. And when they go to throw some piece of plastic away, they look, they hold it up to the note. Anything two inches or smaller can fall through the conveyor belt at the uh, recycling facility, the sorting facility. So there's like a metal mesh like that. And everything goes, all the recyclables get bulldozed up onto this conveyor belt and then they go up and around and go through blower tanks and float tanks and all this sort of thing and then get picked over by humans. Um, but the anything smaller than two inches will can fall through the grate and mess up the machinery uh, and not make its way. So yeah, I just uh, 
have a, have a whole bag full of empty medicine bottles. I took the trouble of taking the labels off and I don't know what to do with them. There used to be a place up in Barry called the uh, uh, Additional Recycling uh, ARRC. It's part of the Central Vermont Solid Waste District. It's Additional Recycling Resource Center, I think. And they're in a big warehouse and they take all kinds of things, toothbrushes and toothpaste tubes and dental floss tubes. Uh, but they've, again, they've had to cut way back on what they take because um, there's no market for this stuff. So Google ARRC Vermont and you'll see what they take. But um, what was the original question? Oh, the two inch, yeah. Two inches or smaller, got to go in the trash. Okay. Uh, I've got a question about um, milk cartons. It sounds like this person's saying, asking about plastic slash paper milk cartons. So maybe those ones that have like um, cardboard with like a wax addition or something. Uh, one quick addition before I answer the milk carton question is that um, I will, I'm talking about um, MRF's material recovery facility. Casella runs one in West Rutland. If you Google Casella MRF, M-R-F, there's a really cool video that shows you how uh, the system works. You get walked through it and you get a really good idea of how much stuff people throw away and how it all gets sorted. So I highly recommend it. Um, uh, I got, sorry, I got a follow-up question. Why don't they just make smaller grates so the two inch product doesn't fall through? Why do we make bigger bottles? I don't know. <laughs> Talk to the Murph about that. Call the Murph, okay. Uh, that's a good question. The other thing I wanted to add about, about a material recovery facility, a lot of people uh, still are throwing plastic film, plastic shopping bags, plastic whatever, into your uh, single stream uh, uh, recycling. And please don't, because it gums up the machinery in those MRFs and causes the whole place to shut down and people have to climb in and pry them out. So uh, if those can go to your local uh, grocery store, if you ask them, but please don't put them in with your, your regular recycling. Oh, milk. Uh, plastic milk jugs number two uh, are one of the things that can be recycled, hallelujah. Um, depending again where you live, some, sometimes you can leave the cap on, sometimes you should throw the cap away. But to be safe, I would throw it away don't recycle it, it's less than two inches. The milk cartons that are cardboard, that coating is no longer, uh, no longer wax, it's plastic. Um, so those are, uh, those are not recycled in this area. All right. Um, is anyone in Vermont harnessing the heat from compost piles for use? I guess maybe for use for energy or something like that? The VTC, Vermont Technical College, did have an anaerobic digester that they were using. Uh, you know, the, their, their cow manure was going in there and they were footing, putting food scraps in. They have, have had to shut that down because they haven't, you know, it's just, it, it, they, it's, they, they, those things have to run all the time. And again, there's not enough material generated for them to run it all the time. Plus I think VTC is, uh, financial uh, I don't want to not I don't want to give false stuff but I, I think they were they were struggling with finances at one point I think that was one thing that they stopped doing um, that's a really good question I know that the Lebanon landfill is talking about it if you ever drive by the Lebanon landfill which is on 12a just south of uh, Home Depot you'll see all these big PVC white pipes sticking out that's the methane gas coming out right now it's not being harnessed but um, uh, I think they're, they're thinking about that. I know that it, there's a lot of discussion about it uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know more about it, but again, that's another thing that you might, um, might Google or you know, contact the Lebanon Landfill or uh, Chittenden Solid Waste. They're the you know, mother load of, of uh, solid waste districts in the state. And they're doing a lot of things that uh, we smaller, districts cannot do. So that might be another place to check. 
Thank you. Um, we're going back to paint. What about empty paint cans with no paint in them? Can they be recycled? Uh, yes, if they're totally empty. Uh, I believe that Hartford will take them in their scrap metal pile. They do not go in your regular household recycling. Do you have to like wash them out inside? Well, uh, you they have to be pretty darn clean. Uh, you know, again, if there's any question, throw them away. But um, yeah, if you, if it's latex paint and you've gotten all of it out and you want to, you know, wipe it out with a rag or rinse it out, I think it probably would be okay. Again, that would be a question to ask uh, Hartford two nine five two six seven three. Just uh, they could probably give you a, a better answer. But that's that's my my guess is that there it's okay if it's completely empty and clean. You've got that phone number down, yeah. Um, I call it all the time. <laughs> um, we have a question about, I'll confess, I don't know what this is, but a lot of the, the question is, a lot of products are now in Tetra Pak containers. Are those recyclable or are they trash? I don't know what that is. Do you, Tetra Pak? Um, Tetra Pak, I believe they're asking about um, what we call aseptic containers, boxes. Uh, and if this isn't correct, this person should chat again and say, no, that's not what I mean. Um, yes, um, soup and chicken broth and uh, rice milk and all sorts of things. Um, they are not recyclable in this area. I will tell you a secret. My sister lives out near Schenectady uh, and I, I drink rice milk. And I save up a large bag of those. I flatten them, I rinse them out, I take the plastic spout off, I throw it away, and I take them over to her, and her trash hauler recycles them. But again, Vermont doesn't generate enough volume to make it worth anybody's while. Okay. If you lived outside of Boston or New York or LA or San Francisco, my guess is that you could recycle all that stuff, but not here in Vermont. Frustrating. Um, Very. Yeah, there's just a comment on that here. Okay. Um, let's see. Plastic number five is sometimes collected for separate recycling, um, like they do at the co-op, possibly because it's more easily recycled or more valuable than other numbers. Is this greenwashing or is it worth keeping it separate? That one's maybe have stumped me. Um, I would ask the co-op where it's going and what's happening to it. Um, I know that um, the, and, I'm embarrassed not to know this, the black plastic, the clamshells, the stuff that you buy your chicken in, uh, or your deli stuff, your sushi, um, black plastic, not sure if that's five or seven. Um, that is not recyclable because they can, nobody wants it because you, you can't turn black plastic into anything else but black something. And so nobody wants it. So again, if you can avoid buying it, please do so. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer about the number, the number five. Um, I, I would ask the co-op and I can research that if somebody wants to send in their email address or contact number and get back to you. The person says, no problem, I'll ask the co-op, so. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, hey, we're going back to paint cans. Um, what about plastic paint cans? <laughs> uh, yeah, more of them are plastic. Look on the bottom. Uh, it, I think chances are it might say number two on it. And, uh, if so, you can probably put that with your, with your regular recycling. But in that case, it's got to be rinsed out. It's got to be really clean. Um, it's the reason you can't recycle uh, your motor oil containers, number two, 
they're black or yellow or red because uh, you can't get them clean enough. And you don't want to send them to the recycling facility with oil in them. So you're, you know, if you change your own oil, throw, you're going to throw out the container. So I would say the same thing about the, the plastic paint cans. Look on the bottom. It says number two. Get it completely clean. Put it in your single stream recycling. Otherwise, uh, throw it out. It can go with uh, it can go with a paint care collection. If you have paint left over in a plastic container, you can take it to the Hartford transfer station, and they will accept it um, as long as it has a label with the other paint cans. Great. Um, any more questions on paint? Throw them out there. Um, why did you say that you don't add tissues to your compost? Uh, I think that's a personal thing. Um, first of all, I don't use tissues. I, use my godfather's handkerchiefs, um, but most people don't do that anymore. Um, there's, there are varying, there are varying uh, thoughts on this. Some people uh, say it's fine. Um, I go by the belief that there are probably some kind of dyes uh, or chemicals in the tissue and that I just don't want that in my compost if I'm putting that on my, on my vegetable garden. It's not, it's not considered paper recycling either. I don't know if I said that, but tissues are either, I mean, if you, if you want to put in your compost, that's your thing, go ahead. Uh, but if not, they are not recyclable. Same with paper towels, same with toilet paper, unused. Those are trash, not, um, not paper. Okay. Um, I'm just double checking, I think. And Michael, you're welcome to look at this too. I think I've gone through all the questions. Good thing is it's 631. Yeah, that was good timing. I'm happy to stay here and answer questions all night. Yeah, if anyone has anything lingering, type it in now. I'm just kind of scrolling and making sure we got everything. Um, one now. Oh, um, Heather Wolf has posted an article on the, from the Upper Valley Co-op on um, plastics and why they collect number five. So at the end of the article, so we can all click on that and read it to learn about it. Cause I didn't know they did that quite frankly. Thank you, Heather. I didn't either. Yeah, so Ham, do you have any final, oh, there's Michael. There's Did I miss any question. questions, Sorry. Michael? Yeah, um, um, Diane Fisk asks, what about the electronics in a smoke or CO2 detector? Is that recyclable? No, as far as I know. Um, if you want the ultimate answer on that, um, you could contact the Vermont uh, Department of uh, Environmental Conservation, DEC, uh, the Solid Waste Division. And I'm sorry, I don't have their phone number in my head, but it's VT, DEC, Solid Waste Division, and um, pose that uh, question to them. But as far as I know, uh, that they're not recyclable. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any any final thoughts, Ham, or like ideas you want to leave people with? <laughs> when in doubt, throw it out. Hey. You throw something away. Where is away? Um, I think I've talked enough. I I would uh, just I want to thank you and Michael both again for for having me. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, Ginevra and I were just talking about uh, before you all joined us that we had spent, Ginevra, what was your six hours shoveling? That was Michael's was six hours. Mine was, was three. Hours plowing. <laughs> uh, and so I think a lot of us, if not um, all of us have not maybe been out shoveling or dealing with snow today and it is beautiful. Uh, here in Windsor, we got 32 inches um, and I'm thrilled, but it's, uh, I don't shovel like I used to. <laughs> so um, I hope you all are um, being safe and uh, enjoy the snow. I just want to reiterate, 
contacting the district, contacting me if you have questions. Uh, that's what I do, and that's what I like to do is answer questions. Thank you so much, Ham. You've got a lot of people thanking you in the comments, so thank you all.